following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, do you have any idea what it means to be baptized for the dead? Well, that's a very good question. Yes, I agree that it's a good <laughs> question. We'll talk about that this evening on the program. Good evening, my name is Keith Sharp. I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Trevor, please introduce yourself and the congregation to Piet. Sure, thanks Keith. Yeah, my name is Trevor Campbell and I preach over in Piet. I worship with the church there that meets there in Piet on Highway 62 in Piet. We're located on the north side of the highway there. Uh, if you're in Marion County, we'd love to have you come out and worship with us. We meet on Sunday mornings right now at 1045 a.m. Uh, currently, we're not having the Bible class. We hope to restore that in the future, though. But uh, 1045 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And you'll see my phone number on the screen there. You can call that number if you have a question about the church that meets there or if you want to discuss anything biblical with me or if you have a question for this program that you would like to have us discuss on the program. That number is 870-435-2737. You folks over in Marion County, keep in mind the pie at Church of Christ. Good folks over there that stand for the truth and you will be edified by assembling to worship with them. Be in touch with Trevor. Now for those of you who live here in Baxter County, I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. We meet one mile south the Highway 62 412 by bypass on Highway 5 going down towards Salesville on the left, uh, just past Good Samaritan. And we have our Sunday morning worship assembly at 11 o'clock. That's our only service at this time during the pandemic on Sunday. We also have a Wednesday service at 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. And we have a ladies' Bible class that is resumed meeting at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, and that's a very good ladies' Bible class. They're currently studying prayer. We invite you to be a part of these, and you ladies keep that ladies' Bible class in mind. Now, if you have a question for me, and of course your questions provide the subject matter for this program, if you have a question for me, then you can contact me, Keith Sharp, by calling 870-321-5746, or you can email me at Keith Sharp. And that sudden link is an old address. I need to get that changed. Sorry about that. Uh, the tr address now will be KeithSharp2021 uh, at gmail.com. Let me give that again. KeithSharp2021 at gmail.com. Or you can write to Post Office Box 263 in Mountain Home, 72654. Please let us know what your question is. Well, Trevor... We have a question that was given to us some time ago. We're just now having the time to get to it. And the question is, please explain 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. So Trevor, I'm counting on you to do that. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot to be said about it. Uh, it is certainly a difficult text. I'll go ahead and uh, read it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29 says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Uh, and certainly that is a, a peculiar verse when you come across it. But, uh, you know, the entire chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with the resurrection of the dead. And he's making the point that there is a resurrection of the dead. However, as he goes along, he makes a number of points as to what would be true if there's not a resurrection. If there's no such thing as a resurrection, then there are certain truths that, that have to be. And uh, this is, I believe, verse 29 is just another one of those points that he makes in the context of what would be the case if there is no resurrection. Now, when the Corinthian church received this letter, I think it's important to bring out, uh, the waters weren't so muddied at that time as far as uh, doctrine about this. You know, uh, denominations, there are denominations today and have been for some time that teach a baptism on behalf of the dead, being baptized for someone that's passed on before you. Uh, but when Paul wrote this, those denominations didn't exist, nor did that teaching exist. You know, baptism in secular history was uh, uh, something conducted by the Jews. Uh, and then the first time we see it in the Bible is in, uh, in the gospel accounts in which John the Baptist, John the Immerser, the baptizer, that gentleman, John, 
uh, was baptizing people, God commanded him to go and baptize individuals, and it was a baptism of uh, repentance for remission of sins. Then Jesus came along, and his apostles baptized individuals, and then after Jesus was raised from the dead, he gave instructions to his apostles to go out and to baptize in his name. And so that's the baptism that we read about in the New Testament, is the baptism that Christ gave his apostles. And so, uh, and this is the same baptism we preach today. But here in the, in the text, uh, you know, the Corinthians are seeing this for the first time. Verse 29 is not about something that was actually being practiced. It's about something that would be true if there's no resurrection. Uh, and again, Paul makes a number of these different points. So I'm going to come back to uh, earlier in the chapter, earlier in the context of chapter 15. I'll begin reading at verse 12. And I'm not going to read very far, but just a, a few verses here. And we'll notice there's a number of certain truths if there's no resurrection. And Paul's going to give, give some of these to us. In verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Well, there's one point right there. If there's no resurrection, that means Christ didn't rise. And if Christ is not risen then our preaching is, preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Well, this would be the case for us today. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, our, our faith is empty. Verse uh, 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he had raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Well, there's another point. We're all still in our sins, even if we've been baptized into Christ, because he's not been risen. Verse 18, Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that is, those who have passed away or died, that were in Christ, have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So he makes a number of points here as to what will be the truth of the case if Christ is not risen, if there's no resurrection of the dead. Now he's going to go on from here in verse 20. He says, now Christ is risen from the dead. He's going to go on and talk about that and what that means. But then in verse 29, I believe he circles back around and gives us another one of these points. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then why are you baptized, or why are you baptizing people for the dead? You know, if all are dead, as he said, if there's no resurrection, those who in Christ have perished, and Christ himself is not risen, well, that reckons everybody to be dead, essentially. Everyone's perished. Well, then why are you baptized for the dead? In verse 30, he makes another point. He says, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? That was a very good point the Apostle Paul was making, because he and the apostles, their lives were on the line continually. They were continually under persecution. Their, their life was always in danger. And Paul's saying, why would we waste our time preaching all this stuff if it's not true? If there's no resurrection, we all perish uh, you know, your faith is empty, as he said, and you're still in your sins, and those who die just simply perish. So why are they baptized for the dead? And that's just, again, I think another point that he's making, another certain truth. Baptism, in baptism, there is a, a union with Christ that takes place. We're baptized into Christ, we're buried with him as he was buried, and we rise to life. Colossians chapter 2 talks about this, how we're buried with him and that we rise to life just as Christ arose from the dead. So in the actual act of baptism that God has given us, there is a view towards the resurrection. But if there's no resurrection, then why are we being baptized? And Paul makes the point that you're simply being baptized on behalf of the dead. So that's to kind of kick things off, Keith. I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Well, you were just right on the cusp of answering that for me, and, and then you quit and turned it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing. No. no Good, you're setting the context, and that's very good, and I'll pick up there. And yes, the whole theme of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the certainty of the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and the entire chapter, it's a 58-verse chapter, it's a long chapter, and the entire chapter is based on, or is directed toward uh, the proof, the doctrinal proof that there is a general resurrection of the dead based on the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And so because we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, therefore we have the hope that we too should be raised from the dead. And uh, Trevor pointed out, he makes various arguments uh, to show this. 
Uh, and I believe that verse 29 begins a section where he shows the inconsistency between a denial of the resurrection of the dead and what they were practicing. And one of the things they were practicing was, in some sense, there was a baptism for the dead. I'm just going to reread verse 29, uh, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. That's the translation I usually use. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? I think a key here might be the meaning of that little preposition for. Now, oftentimes in, in Scripture, the preposition for, uh, and, and forgive me for looking in a little bit at the, at the Greek, sometimes, it, usually, in fact, it's a translation of the Greek preposition eis, in English letters E-I-S. Uh, and that is not the case here. It's a different preposition. It's the preposition who pair. Uh, and that preposition, I'm repeating Thayer's Greek lexicon here, that preposition has the uh, primary meaning of in behalf of or for the sake of. Uh, and, and still you could think, that, all right, uh, are you baptized so that you can save someone who is dead? And there's at least one denomination that takes it that way and practices that. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS, usually known as Mormon, they uh, have living people baptized in behalf of dead people in order to save those dead people. Well, one principle that we have to follow in our interpretation of Scripture is that the Scriptures do not contradict themselves. In John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus uh, prayed to the Father, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God is truth. And it's a principle concerning truth. Truth does not contradict itself. If someone contradicts himself, then he's not telling the truth somewhere because truth is consistent. It does not contradict itself. And so this principle or this, this belief that we're baptized in order to save someone who is dead, does that harmonize with the rest of the Scriptures? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We're going to be judged on the last great day by the things that we have done in our bodies. We're not going to be judged by what somebody has done for us in our behalf after we're dead. We're going to be judged by what we've done while we're still living in this body. And so the belief that I could be baptized for a, a long dead relative, or for, for, even for somebody that I don't know, never did know, to be baptized and save them though they're already dead, that would contradict 2 Corinthians 5.10. We'll all be judged on the basis of what we've done in this life, not what somebody's done for us, after we're dead. And so that must not be the meaning of the word baptism or the, or the statement baptism for the dead. I'll suggest another. In fact, let me just read to you. This is the International Standard Version translation. Now, it is an essentially literal, good translation that I consult. I'm not just pull, pulling up some translation that I would never use that I think makes this clearer. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29 as it reads in the International Standard Version. Otherwise, what will those people who are being baptized because of those who have died? If the dead are not raised at all, why are they being baptized? Because of them. One reason that you might be baptized is so that you can be reunited with your saved, dead loved ones who have gone before you. It would be a, reu a reunion in heaven. And certainly that's a legitimate reason to be baptized. And it would appear to me that this is a good translation and a good explanation of a difficult passage. Well, I've done the best I can on that, Trevor. I'm going to kick it back over to you now. All right. Well, uh, Keith, I was uh, wanting to talk a little bit about why we are baptized and what happens when we are baptized. Um, you know, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 is, uh, is where Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost after the Holy Spirit had come given them knowledge and understanding, and Peter preaches 
the, the people that they need to repent, first of all, which that's a change of heart and mind, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, or more plainly, the forgiveness of sins. So, you know, Paul had mentioned that in 1 Corinthians 15 in some of the texts that we read, that, uh, you know, if Christ is not risen, then you're still in your sins. The truth is, Christ has risen, and we've been baptized in the likeness of his death and burial and raised to walk with him in a, in a newness of life, having our sins forgiven at that point. And at that point, we enter into a relationship, a union with Jesus Christ, and we become one of his people, one of his children. So we're baptized so that we can have our sins forgiven so that we can be with Christ and have that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to read a text out of Romans chapter 6. And in Romans 6, in beginning of verse 2, he says, How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? All right, so once we're baptized, we put away sin, we put away those, those desires. And, and of course, even after you're baptized, you're going to commit sin. We, we make mistakes. Uh, John in 1 John talks about this. If we say that we have no sin, uh, we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. You know, the fact is we do err and we make mistakes. But the point is to be living a life that is in accordance with God's will, trying to keep from those temptations, trying to keep from giving in to those, those types of temptations. In verse 3 he says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness, excuse me, likeness of his resurrection. And so that's what we're looking forward to. Jesus was raised from the dead. When we come up out of the waters of baptism, in essence there's a, there's a likeness there. We're raised and now we have life. We have life in us that God, God has granted us that life and given us that life. He's forgiven us of sins. But from, from there on, when we talk about the day of judgment, we talk about the, the final trumpet, well, we will be raised as Christ was raised. We can expect that, and, and it's not a, a hope as in, you know, like some people hope they win the lottery. It, it's it's a, an expectation. We can expect it because God has promised it to us. And so that should be very reassuring and comforting to us that if we've been baptized into Christ, we're baptized in the likeness of his death and burial. We're raised to life, and we will live forever with him. When the final trumpet sounds, our bodies will be raised, and we'll be with the Lord forever. Um, another text uh, in Colossians chapter 2, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11, uh, he says, uh, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, but putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Uh, now for our discussion, I'm not going to get into the circumcision portion of what he's dealing with there. But in the, in the text here, again, what we see is being buried with Christ, raised from the dead with Christ, and we were dead, now, or we are dead, excuse me, we were dead, I'll get it right, in our, in our trespasses and sins, but now he's made us alive. And that's one of the points I wanted to make there, is in verse 13. He's made us alive together with him. So we're baptized into Christ, just like he, he died and was buried and arose again. We're buried in the waters of baptism. When we come up out of the waters, our sins are now forgiven. God makes us alive with Jesus Christ, and we're with him. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2, he calls us, Christ calls us, his brethren, brethren of Jesus Christ, part of the family of God. And we will live to get, together with him forever as long as we stay faithful to him. Keith, okay, I've got more, but I'll, I'll stop for a moment because I heard you turning, turning pages no, over there. Trevor, you're doing fine. Just please continue. I'm, Are I'm you enjoying sure? what you're having to say. All right, all right. Well, I want to go to Ephesians for a moment. You know, there is only one baptism. And Paul makes this point in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, and it's a short text, but I think a very important one, where the Apostle Paul brings to light there, there's, there's a oneness, if you will. He talks about there being one God, and one faith, and, and one baptism here, which we'll read in just a moment. And this is important because there are not different types of baptism. There's no such thing as, as being baptized on behalf of the dead, or, or for someone who's died. There's, uh, there's many p reasons people get baptized, but the Bible only speaks of one. And so it is our duty to seek out and search out what is that one baptism, what does it mean? 
Well, we've already seen some passages, I think, that were very clear. That we're baptized for forgiveness of sins. We're baptized so that we can be alive with Christ. Uh, we're baptized in the likeness of his burial and resurrection so that we can also rise from the dead with and be with him one day. Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, in verse 4, Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so there is only one baptism. And again, it's our, it's our job to seek that out and find out what it is. Well, we've given you some passages to consider uh, to see what that baptism is, what that one baptism would be. And baptism truly does save us. We're forgiven of our sins in that act of obedience to God. He cleanses us from sins. We rise up out of the waters of baptism to life. And uh, I want to look at one other passage right now, and that's in 1 Peter in regard to baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now what Peter does in 1 Peter chapter 3, he takes us back to the, the old days, the ancient days, in which Noah and his family, Noah was one of eight people that was saved because they got on the ark that God had Noah make. And uh, that was God's means for salvation at that time. Only eight people got on it, which is a sad testimony to the world at that time, that only eight people would choose God's salvation, the form of salvation that God had given. And that was in the form of this ark, which was a, essentially just a large box made out of wood that Noah and also the animals got upon. Well, here in the text, it says uh, in verse 21, after he talks about Noah, and he talks about the ark being prepared, and eight people, eight souls were saved through that water, he says, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, you know, baptism, again, it has a view to the resurrection in it. We're buried in the waters of baptism, we rise up, and we will rise at the end. Well, notice what he says here. He mentions the resurrection of Jesus Christ in connection here with baptism. It's because of Jesus Christ rising from the dead that when we're baptized and we rise, that Christ can give us life. He's alive. Christ is, is alive. And he says, furthermore, as we already saw, that baptism does save us. So there's one baptism. It's a baptism that saves us from our sins. It cleanses us from unrighteousness. And when we come out of that water, watery baptism, then we walk in a newness of life. We are alive. Christ makes us alive in him. All right, Keith, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there on the baptism for now. All right, now. thank you very much, Trevor. Good discussion. And I hope that the discussion was, was helpful to you. I'm going to do a little bit of summarizing. Uh, from my standpoint, I don't think Trevor and I have any disagreements on it, but just a little bit of summarizing to see if we might be able to help. Now, the original question is, what is the meaning of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29? And, of course, uh, from the uh, New King James translation that I usually read from, it says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And the key here is what does that word for mean, that preposition for, what does it indicate? And I suggested to you uh, that the, the International Standard Version was a, a, an understandable translation. And I, by the way, it's a good, essentially literal translation that is baptized because of the dead. That is, with a view to thinking about reunion with the dead. Now, let's make a practical application of this. Trevor has shown passages that show that baptism is something that we must receive, water baptism, that we must receive in order to be saved, in order to have the hope of eternal life. And so, and it's, it's a burial in the likeness of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so there may be people in this audience who are not Christians, who have not been baptized for the remission of sins. And you may have family members who have gone before that you would love to be reunited with. I think, of course, I've been baptized for the remission of sins. But I think of my parents who were both Christians. I think of my four grandparents who were all Christians. And I remember them uh, with fondness. And I look forward to the day when I can be reunited with them. And it was for someone who has not been baptized, you think of living in the day that Paul wrote uh, to the church in Corinth. Now, at that time... There was persecution on the part of the unbelieving Jews 
against the Christians. But the, the great persecution by the Romans against the Christians had not yet started. But it was going to begin. It was going to be a terrible persecution. And it would not be very long after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians that Nero would begin the persecution by the Romans against the Christians. And there would be people who the other disciples loved, maybe even family members, who gave their life for their faith. And one reason for somebody to be baptized who had not yet been baptized would be in order to be with those dead loved ones who had gone before. So that in the morn of the resurrection, in that hope of the resurrection, which is what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about, our hope of the resurrection from the dead, that in the morn of the resurrection, because we too have been baptized for the remission of sins, we can be reunited with those saved loved ones who have gone before us in a place where we will never, ever be parted again. And what a blessed hope that is, and what a powerful reason it is for someone to be baptized for the remission of sins. Well, Trevor, I've said all that I want to say concerning 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. Would you like to wind it up on that now? Sure, sure. Yeah, since we're, we're talking about the resurrection, and Paul's point in 15, 29 was, you know, if, there is no, if the dead do not rise at all, well, of course he's made the point throughout the text, rather, not just there, but through the text that there is a resurrection. Uh, I want to talk about for a moment, in the brief time we have left, that uh, believing in the resurrection is necessary, that there is a resurrection. In fact, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, in, in the first couple of verses there, uh, the writer there refers to it as the, one of the elementary principles of Christ. It is something that we must believe if we're a, a Christian. In 1 Corinthians 15, though, earlier in the text, uh, I'll just begin reading in verse 1. Uh, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas and by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain at the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also, Paul says. Well, he gives some examples of, of those who witnessed Christ's resurrection, but he says, this is what I delivered first to you. And it was one of the first things he delivered to them, the first things that he taught them, was that there is a resurrection from the dead, that Christ had risen from the dead. And we don't have time in this program, but if you have time, you can go back to Acts chapter 2, which is the day of Pentecost when Peter, Peter preaches to the people there, and that is one of the first things he talks about and shows that Christ has risen from the dead, that there is, in fact, a resurrection of the dead. And so we see this repeated, that it's one of the first principles, it's one of the first things that we should believe and understand. We can't be a Christian if we don't believe there is a resurrection of the dead. And that's why Paul was dealing with some individuals that were, were foolish, if you will, because they did not believe in a resurrection. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why have faith at all? Why practice baptism? Why, why have that, uh, conduct that? Why live as a Christian if we simply perish? In fact, Paul makes that point. You know, if we're just going to die, well, let's just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And he says that also in the text. So resurrection is real. The resurrection of the dead. Christ is risen. We too, if we're baptized into Christ, will rise one day from the dead. And so that's something we can look forward to and be assured of. Thank you so much for watching this evening. Hope you'll join us next time. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746 or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654. And your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.